Call to order. Patty, do you want to call the roll? Sure. Elzel? Here. Doden? Here. Williams? Here. McQueen? Here. Donnell? Here. Also present is Planning and Zoning Admi uh, in Administrator uh, Denise Swinger. Okay. Um, so today we don't have much on the agenda, just old business, right? Do I have to go through all of it? No. Okay. We don't have any review of minutes either. We don't? Um, the nope. minutes. Oh, those, those you, you yeah, there were minutes. Those were from, you approved those in May. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, so we don't have minutes. We don't have any communications, correct? Nope. Um, have a council report. Time for citizens' comments if they show up. Um, we don't have any public hearings, and then we'll be talking about minimum lot frontage, tiny homes, RV parking, and update on the comprehensive land use plan. Yep. Um, okay. So next, don't no. Council report. What's council up to, Marianne? Okay. Council approved three changes to the zoning code. One was the, in regard to signs, allowing more signs. Another was in regard to solar panel definition as uh, what accessory, accessory structures. structures. Mm -hmm. And what was the third? Was it gross density? It was the, the uh, yeah. removal of that. Gross density, net density. Oh, uh, yes. And creating a, uh, the definition of density. Yeah. Okay, that was the DA. Okay. Um, the Housing Advisory Committee sent a proposed housing initiative plan to council for read only. So the next council meeting, which is next Monday, council will be reviewing that and I'll, I can, I'll send that on to Planning Commission. Council had also requested that. Uh, the Housing Advisory Board create a glossary of terms, and that is, uh, we have done that. It'll come to how the Advisory Committee first. And then um, Denise and I went to a workshop in Columbus on Thursday called De something like Dealing with the Forces of Gentrification. And it was rather interesting, I, th I think we thought. Mm -hmm. um, I wrote up a report of that that's going It'll come to council, and I'll just start funneling things. Once things have come to council, I'll send them on to planning commission. Thank you. Okay. Um, we should. I need to open up citizens' comments. Correct. <laughs> you can just I, say as there are no citizens. As there are no citizens here, Spencer. Do you have anything? Oh. <laughs> um. oh, wait. Oh, we have a citizen. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> um, do you have any? Uh, do you have anything um, to bring to the commission that's not on our agenda? No. Okay. I'm going to um, close citizens' comments don't have any public hearings and on to minimum lot frontages yes we want to um, talk about this right so as you know any lot created after the effective date of the code um, shall have frontage on improved public street or approved private street or access easement equal to the minimum required lot width in the zoning district in which it is located um, in reviewing that with the village manager and legal, who determined the following as a result of our conversation at the last meeting, that the current code does not allow flag lots, as we thought. The current code does allow the creation of lots through an access easement if the lot created has the frontage and the lot area required for the zoning district it is in. That's one of the other things that they determined. Um, if a lot is to be created um, without an access easement, it has to have that minimum lot frontage, uh, and the lot it is being subdivided from must also have that minimum lot frontage. 
and according to legal there was a recent case um, in which the applicant wanted to have a variance in order to split the lot and the and the court ruled against that and I'm not I, I asked them to send me that and I did it late today because I just talked to them the other day and um, uh, it had something as like you can't use a variance when the lot isn't already in existence or something to that effect so you you, you, you can't so basically in that one case that we had um, where she, she didn't quite have 120 feet she couldn't go to BZA in order to get a variance to do that um, there's other sections of the zoning code that are going to need to be updated one of the things that uh, legal said you know obviously as we've noted in here we don't have any driveway standards um, that are anywhere in the zoning code really um, and yet um, we need to have those um, with the ability for essential services to be able to reach the the uh, lot as well as um, it needs to have a standard of, to be built to be able to with, with hold a uh, fire truck like 40,000 pounds gross weight um, and then also the other thing we discussed was um, that it needs to be clearly marked address wise so that people can find these lots um, and then of course I think as Ted you had mentioned we have I you know I asked them about the recording of it and they said yeah you have to have that access easement uh, recorded permanently on that on the deed so that's where we stand with what they have said and, and the thing is interesting is that this uh, information has been in you know in the zoning code for quite a while I I don't know I, it might have even been in there prior to the 2013 and that may be why we have some other places around town where there are uh, road access easements to lots I don't know but so then what action that. do we have to take I don't see that we have any action um, well, no, there were some questions, I think. Like, you, like, wasn't there a question about whether the access easement had to run along the, the width or frontage or whatever of the... No. Uh, no, right. No, um, it doesn't, as long as the frontage is on the lot that you're creating. In, in the case that you're talking about it has it would have to if you're sub if you're doing a lot split mm -hmm. um, I think that I, I feel like there and maybe I can just come back with some I just think it needs to be a little more clarified and um, easier for someone to interpret a builder or a, a community member I still don't understand it. Um, plus, we're, there's other sections of the zoning code that need to be updated as well. So they're in in conflict as they are now. No, no. I mean, well, understanding that, if you if we just you know run through this like Exhibit A, then we would have been okay with with okay with how we did Exhibit A, with Exhibit B. Um, uh, he has the has the lot, frontage because it's an existing lot. There is a section in the zoning code that says um, that oh, if there are existing non-conforming lots, then as long as you can meet the setback requirements of that zoning district, then you can build on it. What you couldn't do is have that frontage and create. A non-conforming lot as far as lot area, they'd have to have the lot area and the and the lot frontage that uh, on that property 
off of that road access easement. Um, if they want to do a lot split, as an example, exhibit B1, you'd have to have that frontage, it can narrow and then we go back to the lot. We don't actually have the, these numbered in our okay, packet. Well, I'm um, sorry. It didn't, it's I don't know how that happened. You can figure it out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's kind of, we've been doing through these a few yeah. times. Yeah. Um, so in the case of um, uh, the gentleman that came uh, for the well, West Center College, he could do a road access easement. The issue for him is going to be um, he probably does, he probably would have to remove the accessory structure uh, unless he can determine that he has the lot area and is at least 10 feet back from that accessory structure. He has to, that lot that's being created, if it's a, if there's a primary resident, then it has to be 20 feet away, that property line. If it's a accessory structure like a garage, it's gonna have to be at least 10 feet away. Or mm -hmm. we could say it has to be 20 in all cases. I don't know. So, Denise, I, I have, I guess, two questions. One, it seemed like there wasn't, uh, we haven't defined what a drive, the, the minimum width of a driveway. I mean, I think the maximum width is 30 feet, isn't it? The minimum width of a driveway. So, if there is a road access easement, it seems like we would need to define the minimum width. Yes. And then another question is if it's on one property, there can't, the way it stands now, there can't be two driveways on one property or two curb cuts unless the property is a certain width, which most properties aren't. Is that correct? Um, that's in there, and, I, and that's confusing as well because I don't know if that's talking about on a single lot, like a parking area. Ted, you might even remember that. Is it? There's a. Well, it was in the so. parking. Um, well, am I right that we need to define the Well, I think so. I think width. so. I, I think, you know, I can bring something back as well. But, um, you know, in residential C, you're obviously going to have more um, smaller uh, frontage lots, so there would be more driveways. Um, but I can find that out. I can look into that. I don't know what the norm is. Well, I, I go back to what I've been saying about the, an access easement has to be a minimum. It's considered like two side yard properties combined. That's the way I visualize this from an interpretation point of view. So the access easement has to be the total of the side yard setbacks so that there is a side yard setback rule on that access easement. But is the driveway actually a structure? Would it be a minimum driveway width and plus sides? No. Driveways can go within the side yard setbacks. Okay. And in this case, um, with residential C, we wouldn't want to go as, as, I mean, as, as big as that. As, yeah. as, no, I mean, you can go five feet on a side. Um, you, um, I think it's... Uh, 10 total, and then let me see if I have that. Yeah, there could be a yeah. minimum. You know, yeah, 15, minimum, 20, um, let's sense. see, for side yard, 10, yeah. So we would never want anything as, 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 as uh, minimum as ten, of 10, because that's just not big enough. I would say a minimum has to be 15 feet. I, I would agree with that. Your driveway? Yeah, the You're access easement. Oh, the driveway easement. itself can you, be 10, 12 feet. You may well, want to consider the necessary width what, for an emergency service yeah, vehicle. Yeah, Colin Altman said 12 feet yeah. to yeah, 14 feet. Yeah. Colin said, yeah, 12 to 14 feet. So, but also, we have to have utility easement, so that goes back to that. Well, that can be under the driveway, but you have to have storm water is probably the biggest thing in place to let that water run off mm -hmm. and channel away from the adjacent property or collect somehow and get wherever it's got to go. Well, that's already in there in terms of driveway. It says. Yeah. Um, so on that, on page five, where you have A, B, A through G, it says um, that on C, a maximum of one driveway shall be permitted per street frontage. 
provided a second driveway may be allowed where the frontage exceeds 200 feet. And that is excessive to me. I think that was, that might have been, um, I don't know, I'm trying to remember where that was at in the code. It, it, it's a little confusing in the code where, and that's why I think we need to have driveways separate, separated out a little bit because it's talking about parking areas as well and off street parking. And so I'm thinking that might have come into play a little bit more in the creation of that. Like, are we not allowed U shaped driveways? Is that, yeah. is that one driveway or that's two curb cuts? Right. So, yeah. So, Denise, are you suggesting that we create a separate section on driveways? Is that what you suggest? Yeah, just add it, in, add it in there as a standard. And F on that same page, I don't understand. It says driveways shall not be located closer than 25 feet to any property line unless approved as a shared driveway for two or more properties. Shall well, we, already, we have a thing that says it has only three feet. Yeah, I, th that's why I just, I think that might be in the creation of a, I think that that, lot. yes, I think that's a parking lot. Mm -hmm. I was just pointing out that that's the only thing that talks about parking in the code. Mm -hmm. And we added, um, uh, like in 2015, um, to a, a, a note that, a residential driveway has to at least be three feet from the side yard. Right. Um, because there wasn't anything in there. So that whole section on page five is more talking about parking lots. Parking lots. Yeah. yeah. Off street parking and facility design, yeah, for, for a parking area. Oh. Hmm. So it doesn't really apply to. Mm -mm. Oh. Uh, in the exhibit C, the West Center College one, wasn't the difficulty there because it required that, that with there was only 75 feet of French to West Center College Street, which wouldn't allow for two driveways. Right. Well, no. no. For two frontages. Right. Yeah, for two frontages. So he can't split it off. No, he cannot. Because it would have to be at least 80 feet. He right. would have to. And if he creates an access easement. But, right. he, but he can if it's just a road access easement. Yes. So the access easement would go the whole length of it back? It would go to his new lot. New lot. And. And that new lot, it wouldn't, it could just, a, a, like, this is the frontage of the lot behind the house. The easement could just be like this, 15 feet across, like that? If or it, would it? Well, if you, have a, if you have a square lot in the back of the lot, the access mm -hmm. easement could come from the street up to yeah. that lot. So that. So lot. how does that meet the minimum minimum lot frontage? That's my question. Well, well, the, the lot, lot has to have that frontage. Across. Oh, oh that's yeah. actually the lot frontage. Okay. Yeah. It's sort of a little, little loophole. Okay. And in that case, he could, if he wanted to, he could split the lot, couldn't he? So that it's not just. The lot split isn't uh, parallel to the street, but say at an angle to get enough no, square footage. He, he doesn't have enough frontage. 150. What's the minimum lot? If, yeah, he could. In in residential B, he, he has, has 50 feet. Easement. He has to have 50 feet. Well, you can't do a lot split. No, he can't. He only has 75. He, either, he can accomplish a lot in the back by having an access easement to that new lot. Right. If he tries to separate the access easement from that property, there isn't enough frontage yeah. to create. No, no, I meant split. using an access easement, but Denise was talking about the accessory dwelling, but if he made, well, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it'd have to be behind, but rather, rather than having it go parallel, it could sort of go like that or something. Or, 
be a weird shape in order to get the. Um, as long as there's I mean, minimum, so you, you, and then you have to think about side yards or rear yards. So this right. has to have a rear yes. yard, and then that has yeah. to have a front yard. But those, you know, you can be creative for things like a tiny home. You know, if you're looking at a an 800 square foot footprint for a tiny home or 600 square foot footprint for a tiny home, those little lots can work. Whereas before they never did. When the code was written, you know, and conceived of, those nobody thought we'd ever be there. You know what I mean? So you're looking at a 1,200 square foot footprint for a house, and then that's how the subdivisions were created. And today, that's just null and void because we're able to make tiny homes go into a lot of little crannies that we never considered before. And we're just trying to make that happen. I think that's cool. So there's there is something in the code that that talks about how you decide what is the frontage, what is the rear yard. That's all set. But there isn't anything as far as where you place your house. You could basically put your house in any direction you wanted. Yeah, you could yeah. call any of your four property lines the frontage. There's nothing that dictates that that frontage has to be on the public right of way if it's an access easement. There yeah. is none. There's no the, orientation the, to an access easement. The oh, I see what you're saying. The only the only thing that I've ever seen in in the code though, when I've had to determine front from back, is that the it's the shorter. Uh, if it's uh, say it's on the street, the shorter of the the two lines of the to make the lot becomes the front. The shorter of the two becomes the front and back, so that the side yards are the longer. Yeah, well, that makes logical sense, but I, I don't think. But that there's lots of lots that aren't that way. I'm sure. Well, there's a. It would have to have a definition about defining what is the front yard and we yeah. don't do that. Yeah. You know, I mean, and there's one right across the street on left South Center College that's 100 feet across and then 76 feet back. Right. So, right. so, so I was thinking that um, I would, uh, if everybody is in agreement with this understanding, I mean, once that, that was clear to me, it was easier to then go and be able to say, um, you know, boom, 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 no, yes, no, yes, you know. Mm -hmm. um, it was much easier. And in the case of um, Exhibit D, um, the uh, property, yeah, the last one. Oh, yeah. Street. Yes, that um, if there is the frontage, or if there is the... Um, lot area in the front and the setback can be maintained there's no reason why that they couldn't put that lot in the front make create that lot in the front too and the, put an access easement on either side and and, yeah. and then the the ax the access easement goes to the existing house yeah I, I, I'm looking forward to, um, this makes sense to me now, thank you, and um, I, I'd like to, to see some language that is more clear for us to My only issue is that, amend. you know, in the, the second paragraph, the italicized comment where it says, any lot created after the effective date of law of this code shall have frontage on an improved public street or approved to the street or access easement. So that's what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Just define those th three things. And then it states equal to the minimum required with lot width, which is basically the, the frontage. Mm -hmm. I think that in, in the legal interpretation by making an access easement created a lot without frontage, that needs to be changed. Um, to access. explain our explain Agreed. our conversation yeah. with, with, about that the easement can be extended to create your frontage along the easement. 
That's what I. Well, yeah. You, you mean from the for the back? The, yeah. Oh. Well, to be. Yeah, go ahead. The easement would not stop at the property line. Yeah. If the easement continued on along the, the, the line of the new property in a great enough distance to create the frontage, now the frontage is along the easement as well. Okay. Makes sense? That's okay, you cumbersome. Know, it is cumbersome, but you don't really have to change the language. It's just because the easement just has to be extended it doesn't stop at the line of the new property. The easement simply extends along the line, uh, on past where they meet, along the line of the new property in a great enough distance to create the frontage along an easement. And so that, then, that's how we did you that. You could have multiple lots along that continuous easement. That's correct. So if you, again, use your example of here's, here's the lot, okay, and you're gonna split it this way, which is like the South College, your easement comes up all the all way, the way, creates the frontage the front. along the created uh, lot. That's what I that, was trying to say. That yeah. Makes sense to me then. Okay. okay. That way, you're, you. it is along an easement, which is permitted, yeah. and your frontage is established. Now, all you have to do is abide by the setbacks for that particular. It's like if there was a road there, a tiny Correct. road. Yeah. But if you do that, then that means. So let's say the original property is the front property and they're creating a back slot. Mm -hmm. Then that easement is still part of the front property. The easement is part of both properties at that point and part must be recorded on the deeds of both properties. Oh. Because it has to be there in perpetuity for the lot to be created. Now the one thing that... Um, Never works. One, the one thing that um, had been given as an example for the, for the Quarry Street one um, is if if he had didn't had not had the frontage, let's, and that was the example that we gave, that if he could have gotten the frontage from his neighbor, he could have turned that easement and then gone along the back of their frontage. You're talking about Quarry Street now. Yeah. Okay, I'm trying to pull it up. Um, but as it ended up, he had he was in residential C. You had it a second ago. Yeah, I'm trying to yeah. get it. It's hard to get it. Soon. He had um, 40, he had a foot 40, over what he yeah. needed. Yeah. Um, so he could just do it. So he, he was fun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So do you remember the, there was someone who'd um, maybe like a year ago came to us and had, was trying to build back from the street um, and had purchased this property from a family and the family didn't want him to be able to build another lot of house back there and there was yes, like I know that do you, do you do you remember that do you remember when that no happened situation. no cuz the Perry property yeah were, were you on no, none no, of no, you I were here <laughs> well i mean where is the property it's at on Dayton street it has access on Dayton street yeah. big big very big property with multiple houses on it. Yes. Is it and, the, oh, Denise, it's the Oh, it's one. the one that we, we granted a, yeah. yeah. That, was, that was a lot that? split. Yeah, because he had the frontage. Okay. Yeah, he had the frontage to create the lot split. Okay. Yeah. I didn't know if that was a flag yeah. lot situation. No, and he actually, not. his property was actually giving the easement to them, mm -hmm. which oh, even yeah. made it more stronger for him. Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. I remember because they were upset. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't right. remember yeah. very well, but um, okay. So, but that so, wouldn't have applied here. I'm just trying to think of like if there have been times when we haven't been interpreting the rules in this way and we've been, you know, denying lot splits because of not interpreting it in, in this particular way. And is this, this oh. is not a change to the zoning code. It's, it, it's clearing up what we already have. Everyone's okay with that. I'll come yeah. back with something more that maybe clarifies it a little bit more and then some language on the driveways. Okay, I'd, I'd like to actually sees maybe it would be more difficult to get passed through council I don't know but like maybe an update to it that would um, 
make the easement less cumbersome. What, what we're talking about, the easement going all the way up through the new lot um, and making that, I don't know if it's taking it too far. Well, I, I but can, cha I, actually I changing the My zone issue has always been under, over that equal to the minimum lot width. Yeah. Okay, that's that statement. And if the access easement is the mechanism to create new frontage, mm -hmm. that makes sense to me. Okay. So I think that could be achieved through a graphic. Okay. You know, a simple graphic that shows what that is in that definition. And it should also be shown um, in the other examples, a private street or public is already defined on the public street. Yeah. A private street is also defined because yeah. there's no difference. So the access easement has to just be defined to show how that frontage is created in a graphic. And I think we're there. Yeah. Um, what about flag lots? Yeah. Um, that's a topic for discussion. Um, that's not, I mean, I kind of, right now, I kind of just want to get through this and <laughs> see where we're at on that. It might be something that you might want to talk to. Um, I don't know. I mean, we, we, I think we need to talk about it, but I don't. Well, I guess my question would be if you can create a lot behind another lot using the easement to create frontage, why do you need to clarify a flag lot? Well, some people might want to do that. Some people might, well, for example, someone might not want to have responsibility for maintaining a driveway for someone else, which is probably what, it, if you have an access easement, you So, so okay, so yeah, you're yeah. saying the creation well, of a maybe, flag lot through the sale of the, pro the property that creates the driveway, uh, not an easement, yeah. okay. No, I understand that. So, but, so Denise, you, are you saying that you would like to get this access easement stuff done? I, I, then I, I would like to get through this and then we the can flag definitely lot. talk about that see, okay. and kind of see what happens with it. I don't think a lot of people realize that they could do this. Um, yeah. So it, will, it might open a bunch of, I mean, yeah, yeah the easement is a, is a bit more cumbersome than a flag lot, but it does sort of do well, the personally, same thing. Personally, I would like us to consider flag lots. Yeah. I'm fine yeah. waiting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Do you have anything to say? Well, a flag, if you, a flag lot would be, that would have to be approved by zoning and a new plat would have to be recorded and it's a big expense. An easement, like in this situation, he owns all three of those parcels. So he can grant an easement from himself to himself, and the easement exists unless you get a court order to vacate the easement. So an easement is filed in a deed, and then if it, a couple times, if it changes properties, the easement's not always included, but it's always there. So someone could build and not know there's an easement right. at all. But this would be, I mean, this is just owner, owner to owner, or buyer to seller. Mm -hmm. You know, if you, if you could get two lots, together, two parcels together, you can create an easement and have two properties on there. And no one's the wiser. You know, like, Zoni would never really know about it. Because you don't just file an easement, it's the deed. So when I sell you my property, I put the language in there. By the way, there's a driveway easement. I created But to it be myself. able to build on that lot, <clears throat> yeah, you'd have to define the lot as a separate lot. Right, but the easement, no one has to approve the easement I create myself. Oh, I see. So it doesn't need to go through any kind of certification. No one has to rubber stamp it or anything. Yeah. Which is good and bad. Right. Yeah, it seems like it is bad in that we want to know where every property is. We want to have property. Uh, we want to have access. We want to have yeah. access for emergency vehicles right. and stuff. So you wouldn't know you wouldn't know an easement exists without doing a title search on each right. property. You would know how the parcel, if it's a flag easement or if it's a flag parcel, then hypothetically, there'd be a chunk cut out of yeah. the highlighted red going to the lower yellow. Well, can't yeah. we require that, that, that people create easements? I'm not sure. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. As yeah. part of Denise's approval of building on any particular lot, she's going to make sure that it has the appropriate access. Yeah. Whether that be you have that's, to bring me the recorded easement or... Well, their easements aren't recorded. They're just a part of the deed. Yeah. For the most deeds, are recorded. Deeds, deeds are recorded. Deeds are recorded, yeah. 
part. He's been <laughs> complicated at the property sell right. a couple of times right. as well, but it's no longer the same because, people living yeah, there. Yeah, you could sell it to someone else after I put an easement. You don't want them to know about the easement because it may be a problem. You just you don't add it in the next deal. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so you you sell it to oh, the next so, person. Oh, so and you you just you don't add it to your next deed and then it goes away. It doesn't go away. I mean, if oh. someone finds it, it still exists. Oh. You could get a, a court order to vacate it if there are no parties that and, want it around. Want kind of like if you want to change your name. Okay. You just say I want to change my name. You put it in the paper, and if no one objects, then you can change your name. I so see. if no one objects to this name, right. <laughs> right? To vacating it, then you could. <laughs> But the purpose of the of, of putting it on the deed, as Ted had pointed out, I mean, it's it was somewhere along the way, title searching or mm -hmm. buying, that they're going to catch that so that it <clears throat> we don't have problems, you know, 50 years from now for people. But yeah, and, and it may get lost and a, and a sale may go through, and that's why you have underwriters and title insurance. But if someone started building a house and then they find out they don't have any access, like the lot in question is completely landlocked mm -hmm. without that easement that he granted to himself in order to build the lot. Right. So I don't you know. And what see, happens. we have a lot of those lots already created around that are landlocked. So you're suggesting probably that they should also look at, go and look at past deeds to see if there was ever any, why, how did that get created? How did that? He, yeah, with this, he created it on the plat because he, he, he bought the, I think it was two lots originally, and then he split one of them into two. Yeah. So he created a plat. But that shouldn't have been allowed. Well, that, yeah. Well, I mean, allowed, they, well uh, in our code, we didn't, we didn't do a minor subdivision. But not without. He wasn't creating more than five lots. But he was creating a lot that was landlocked. No, that lot, that lot was already there. He was only, he was only making two and the one that that other one was already there oh, okay the landlocked one was already there. yes so then he granted the easement on the plat yeah yeah instead of combining them so what what would be the solution to that recording the if, if it's legally i don't know if it's legally feasible to if as this as zoning to say i don't think you could you could ask for easements to, to be run by the office or not? I don't think you could. Why not? Because it's a it's a private sale. Mm -hmm. It's person to person. Um, well, yeah, it doesn't matter yeah. unless they were going to build on it. Right. If, if they were going to build on it, we'd have to approve it. It's part of the zoning code. <laughs> well, for the, well they would just access. buy land and then they would decide to build on it later. So maybe yeah. once they brought it up. Uh, yeah, but sure. if we require yeah. that any lot on that has a building on it or residence anyway, has to have access to the street and has to have a sign indicating what the address is. Well, why would you build, buy a lot that you couldn't build a house on, right? Like, so that's the thing. If someone's buying a lot. You don't want to put a cow on. Right? Yeah, or, no, I know. Or but, yet, if you but, buy a house yes. on a lot and then they, for some reason the easement becomes a problem after right. you bought the lot. Yeah, then Maybe. that's your bad. Well, yeah. Right. yeah these are all, these are you all didn't make sure that there was a access to your house. Because you'd have a landlocked rental, right. and then these two right next to each other. But if there's an easement on your deed for a, for a, a budding lot, you still have to maintain that easement, whether or not you know about it. Like. Someone could tell you about well, it, and then in, you're in the case to... of Xenia Townships that I had as an example. Um, now, this wasn't talking about separate lots, but what it did say in there is there there will not be more than one principal structure per driveway unless approved by the township board of zoning appeals. And if they do approve it, then the, the board of appeals um, requires all deeds include covenants and agreements indicating that the said lane or drive is a private drive and that it shall be maintained and kept it in good state of repair by the private landowners to whom the lane provides ingress and egress. The covenants and agreements shall clearly indicate that said private drive and individual turnaround are not public roadway and that Xenia Township shall have no responsibility for maintenance of the private drive and or turnaround. So it's actually the person that is granted the access that has to maintain it on someone else's property? Wow. 
It's how you write it works. up. It's how yeah. you write it up. It's I mean yeah. you can yeah. write it up to make one person responsible or both parties responsible. Mm-hmm. I guess like you yeah. said, it's a private yeah. Well, yeah. I matter. I looked at I looked at a house when I first got here and it's at the end of West South College where it turns in Green Street goes this mm-hmm. way mm-hmm. and there there's a there are two private drives yeah. that come off this way. And I looked at the house all the way at the end. And when I looked at that house, I was told that if I bought that house, that I was part of my responsibility, along with everybody else that lived there, to maintain that driveway, and it was in the deed. Yeah. So. Okay. Well, I'll take this and bring something back that we can add to the code. Can, can I suggest that maybe you combine that language and with the driveway language? Yeah, because it would prevent. Yeah. Yeah, this. Because that way, if it if it says your if your driveway is along an access easement, it must be recorded, um, and in perpetuity be passed on or something like that. Some legal wording that would require. It's a deed that. restriction. Right. Yeah. Legally. Okay. All what right. Do we, do we want to move on yep. to tiny yep. homes, mobile yep. homes? Okay, mobile homes. Okay. So you know we've we've talked about this before, um, and I mentioned that we've received a number of calls from people asking if we allow tiny homes, and my response has been that we do not have a minimum size requirement for a home, and then I always follow with the manufactured home definition which requires that the home is permanently attached to the ground or foundation or on a foundation and has to be connected to utilities. But in doing this research, it seems that tiny homes are really not to be categorized with manufactured homes. In fact, they don't really fit in our zoning code at all right now um, because we have a we have got a definition of a dwelling unit, which does not include portable buildings, but we have no definition of a portable building. We have a definition for a manufactured home, which also includes mobile homes, but not RVs or temporary buildings. But as I said, a tiny home is not a manufactured home either. So what I found, and I had that in one of the exhibits, was that the International um, Residential Code uh, created a, a definition of what a tiny home is. And it's in the International Residential Code as an Appendix Q. And a tiny house is a dwelling that is 400 square feet, 37 square meters or less in floor area, excluding lofts. And it seems that without that definition, being able to get a certificate of occupancy is difficult. Um, So, um, I guess the bigger question is, are we going to accept tiny homes under what, as they are seen, which is, you know, the ones that are immovable and they're on well, wheels? Wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay. let me stop you because that definition that you just gave in the International Building Code only defines that it is a home. Right. As soon as it becomes a home, it's got to comply with all of those standards for being a home, which is permanently secured foundation and connected to utilities. So, but, but, but they can eventually be, if they're anchored, they can be moved later. Yeah, you can yeah. anchor, permanently anchor it and unanchor it just like you anchored it. Okay, so. You put it, you lift it up, you put it on a foundation um, and you cover up the wheel. You literally tie it down. It's wind load requirement. It's, uh, the whole section on wind loading is is what this is all about. How, how do you um, tie it to the foundation? Just like you would have. It's got rails. You know, it's supported on a rail, so the rails just attach to. They can attach to piers. Put, put the piers to. You know, now the reason you still want to do a foundation yeah. is because you've got to be able to secure your your utilities, your water line, from freezing. You know, I mean, things like that. Yeah. 
But but the code is clear. You know, you have to every structure has to withstand wind load, even a sign, a ground sign, um, a mechanical unit on a roof is one that's really people get all bent out of shape about. You know, you have to secure it to withstand 90 mile an hour winds. Um, I think where I've gotten, I've gotten hung up with people on is the idea that it could still have these wheels that makes it um, Well, you would be remiss to mobile, permanently yeah. anchor, you know, you, you can create a pier you can mm -hmm. put the drive the mobile unit into the piers, jack it up, secure it to the piers, take the wheels off, store them in a store and lock someplace else, since there's enough room in your tiny home to store anything <laughs> like <Right>. wheels, <laughs> and and be done with it. But you know, but the idea around a foundation around it is also for other things like weather protection, frost proofing, all of that stuff. And, you know, and I've, seen, I've seen manufactured homes that come on a wheeled chassis yes. that then get attached to piers. Yes. Right. And the wheels, they leave the wheels on them, they just put a skirt around it. And, and they the make augers. But, but, but I, don't, I don't get what the diff why they don't want to be considered a manufactured home then. Well, I don't either. It puzzles me because I, know. I, I can see some tiny homes being built on site. And I, I know of those, and I can see other tiny homes being manufactured. Yeah, there's something. Well, there's is, it about, is it about is it about the zoning codes usually that it, some places don't allow manufacturing? Yeah, they homes? go to a building code. It has to do with being uh, making a distinction by its size and something. It, from what I could gather, and, I, and I'm still not c completely clear, it it's in it. They don't want to be. They want to be able to go to an into a building department and get. A certificate of occupancy and if they say anything other than what that definition is they're gonna have a hard time yes because here's the issue this you know and I mean people misunderstand building codes building codes are a set of minimum standards minimum standards they're not the all these rules that people want to paint them they're literally minimum and I really mean minimum standards so Minimum standards require that your electric system be wired to code. That you don't use some inferior conductor that's going to start your tiny home on fire and it needs to be inspected and permitted. The plumbing needs to comply with health department and plumbing code requirements. That's not hard. You put a trap under your toilet. You know what I'm saying? You don't dump it on the ground. It's, it's those common sense minimum standards that need to be inspected and permitted. The problem with manufactured homes is that that jurisdiction over inspection goes to a state level and in a facility. So the facility gets approval from the state to get all of those inspections on site and then when that unit leaves site it has a sticker mm -hmm. that overrides the local jurisdiction for inspections of all those systems. So what the tiny home market is trying to do is slip somewhere in between an RV, which is a recreational vehicle that doesn't have to get any of those inspection stickers because it's, a, it's literally on wheels, and not get inspected for all those minimum standards. Because it's, it's not occupied as a home. Yes. Ted, Ted, can I ask a question? Do you think that it has anything to do with a home that has a deed as opposed to a home that has a title because it's more of a vehicle that can be moved around. Because I know that that makes a difference in mortgage lending hmm. because a mobile home and a tiny home on wheels have titles just like your car and you cannot get a mortgage on them unless you attach them to a foundation and transfer your title to become a deed. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm so, absolutely positive that that's, that's true of mobile units trying to get financed. I, I'm that. just wondering if that has anything to do with the difficulty in getting an occupancy permit for a mobile home. Well, a mobile home wouldn't... Because you don't get an occupancy right. permit yeah. for a mobile home. It also wouldn't... Is, 
get the standard, the minimum standards of the building code. I mean, like if it's mobile, it won't. It just won't. You just yeah. have People are to making them out of their garage yeah. and yeah. trying to sell them online. Right. And and the building departments are really resistive of that because they become potential death traps. You know, I mean it. Like I said, minimum standards are easy to comply to, but we have to have the jurisdiction to inspect them. And you, if you take something out that's completely finished, and you can't see the wires, and you can't see the plumbing, you can't see the valves, you can't see all that stuff, then it can't be inspected, and it'll get turned down, and they can't get their occupancy permit. Right. Or you go and you make it a mobile home, you know, a mobile unit, where that's a state inspection, and they get a sticker because they're factory made, and they get inspected on, on that. So I don't see how we would want to leap into permitting something that overrides the building code. Number one, we don't. I don't think we can. If if it's you know if we say that it's a home, if it's whatever it is, if it's a home and it's on a lot, then they have to get a permit. So we should just continue to follow the manufactured home, and it doesn't matter if it's that small. That's right. Okay, and because so then it then. If they want to put wheels on it and pick it up and move it, that's their deal, right? As long as it can, yeah, yeah. they can. You can attach those units to the ground. They they even make these mobile home manufacturers make this auger yeah. that they screw into the ground, and then it literally just wraps a cable to yeah. the body of this thing to resist the wind load. So, does is there something in the like the Ohio Building Code that that talks about that? I mean. No, it's the, distinct, the distinction in, in the Ohio Building Code is very simply size of occupiable unit. They go into what the minimum size is for an, a home, a livable ha a, a habitat, and so, so it doesn't matter to them. So there's lots of different ways that you can attach a house to a foundation. Yes. So as so long I, as it meets so, so are you saying that somebody says, hey, I want to put a tiny home on a lot, um, that I need to, part of that is that they need to go get a certificate of occupancy? Mm -hmm. Okay, because that... Anything that, you know, that I mean, just as a rule of thumb, anything that people reside in for any length of time, you know, eight hours plus, has got to get an occupancy permit by the Ohio building. Thank goodness. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's... Yeah. It's a life safety thing. You know, making sure people have smoke. And I mean, because you know, it's it's it hasn't come up before. With I mean, usually you go, you got to go on now, and you got to go through all the processes of getting your house built. So it's never come up where it could be somebody that actually has it already made and wants to put it on a lot. So that's what zoning needs to tell them is that they've got to get a certificate of occupancy from Green County. Yeah, you go fight your battle with the county. Yeah. Don't fight with us. Yeah. yeah. And and then yeah, um, it's small if it's on wheels and it's that. If it's not on wheels, it's tiny and yeah. And then it's if we house. it's building a house. Yeah. And if, if they can get that, then can they be used as an accessory dwelling unit? Sure. Yeah. Okay. It's a dwelling unit. Okay. Um you know, I think our responsibility is, you know, is as a community, as a municipality, is very simply that we got to make sure that we are mandating that this end user follow all the, the laws that we know of, right? right. That, that's our responsibility. If we say that here's a, here's a zoning permit and you don't have to talk to the county even though you're building a home here, we are liable. In the case that that thing blows away or somebody dies in it, then we become liable. We don't need that. We don't want that. And so you kind of put that into the larger body that's got the jurisdiction, which is the state and then the county, in our case. I mean, I, mean, I would make them do it for signs. I, I, I have them actually have to sign a letter that, so they see in the, in the letter that the next step is to go and at least, at least ask. Yes. At least ask. Maybe they don't need it. I mean, but. You know, I, I didn't open up a public hearing for the, um, for the flag lot discussion. 
Well, Why don't you going? finish this discussion okay. and you can go yeah. back. Okay. Okay. Maybe that. I just I'm reminding myself um, to do that. So for the next one you know, and I did have I had someone also that came and wanted to do like a you wanted to have a group of tiny homes on a on a lot, and I said, well, you know, that becomes basically a tiny home park, and we don't really have anything in our code for that. Um, and so, and that kind of gets into something, you know, honestly, it, it's, it's, that then becomes a business. I mean, and so where would it go? I mean, it, well, really, it could be a pocket neighborhood. It could be a pocket yeah. neighborhood. That's, yeah. Because you can stick yeah. build tiny homes just yeah. like you can. It would only be able to be used as a pocket neighborhood. That'd be about the only way you could do it, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or I guess if you did a PUD. Yeah. But. Who, you know, but I mean, see, I, I guess the question becomes neighborhood. I mean, that's you know, as long as it's not something where, um, if it's something where someone is like saying, I want to have this so that people can come and 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 move it and they operate it more like that, then then it becomes a business. Oh, the you mean where they're coming in and making connection and then moving on? Yes. Yeah. This that's, a, that's a mobile home park. Yeah. yeah. That's an RV park. Yeah. That's not a pocket neighborhood. Okay. But that's, that goes back I mean, to the if they were doing, if they were tiny homes, they would have to get an occupancy permit every single time right. they tied yes. one down. Right. And yeah. inspections on the electric yeah. and plumbing exactly. and all yeah. of that stuff. Yes. That's how you control that. Okay. We don't so, have to. So, and we don't it. have any, we do not allow that. So. No, but we do more than any other community by having pocket neighborhoods. Yeah. So. You know, that's yeah. the desire. I see that is the desire of our community for density. Yeah. It's not to create a, an RV park within the village limit. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I'll do a little bit more on that. And it doesn't need much. I just need to just mm -hmm. maybe just a couple little tweaks on it and bring it back to you. Okay, so I'm gonna open the public hearing about is that okay? Sure. About um, what we were just talking about, which are tiny homes. We have a citizens' comments about tiny homes. Okay, I'm gonna close the public hearing. I'm gonna open the public hearing for the flag lots. Do we have citizens' comments about flag lots? Okay, thank you. Close the public hearing. I just have to do that. Okay. Oh, good. That's our next thing. That is next. Okay, so I've had a lot of complaints from citizens where our, we had RVs parking on the street, um, and we uh, really don't have anything in our code, in, in the zoning code, that it basically just says you can't uh, park on a street or in, or in a alley or anywhere in the village and use it as a dwelling. You're in a public right away. Yeah, right. No. Okay. So, but what's happened is, you know, is we've had people that are doing that and then it, it's like we sent, I asked the police to serve a violation letter because it's only in the zoning code and then um, they can't get access to know if they're actually living in there. They'd have to have the 24-7 surveillance to see what they're doing. And, um, F, you know, it's just become a problem. So we've had, um, we feel like we need to tighten it up a little bit. And, and even the, the recreational vehicle um, language that's in uh, for residential lots, um, allows um, temporary occupancy. Uh, is it 72? It yeah. Yes. So. Um, it's up on the screen. 72. Yeah. Let's see. Um, Here you go. Yeah. Temporary for periods up to 72 hours. Yeah. So. Um, couple of things is um, one I'm wondering if we should make a recommendation to um, council to explore adding something in the general fences code for RV parking 
on in public right of ways like maybe designate certain areas where they can be parked but you know just not all over town and then um, RVs <clears throat> that are on private lots if we could um, maybe tighten that up a little bit more too and I, I did give an example um, that uh, not allowing them to be in front yards um, on private lots for off-street parking and side yards or backyards no front yards if used for temporary occupancy 72 hours in private lots and side yards or backyards no front yards and must be for the use of the owner of the, of the lot or guests of the owner um, I don't know what 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 all what you might I think, think about that two separate issues. there I there are two separate an issues. issue about parking an RV on a private lot and I think there's a uh, an issue parking an RV on a public right-of-way for extended periods of time the issues that we primarily have had have been in the public right-of-way they well, haven't been on private lots is there nothing case, against the health code of living of, of residing in a right I mean right are you shaking her head well because if you periodically go and empty your waste and everything you can leave live in an RV but know, are you so allowed to sleep in your car on the street we have people who do it unfortunately by circumstance I just feel like the cops check in on you and tell you to leave right mm, they Seems check like in on you but if you don't have anywhere to go and you're you're allowed to park your car on the street yeah. so doesn't matter if you're asleep or awake right I mean and yeah. they can't enter yeah. an RV then without a yeah. court order right. and, and the way they do that in most jurisdictions is have a, have an overnight limit right you're only allowed to park no more than 16 hours 24 hours or whatever so that that vehicle moves yeah. at least once a day um, you know for an RV that's what the guy was doing in Village Station line you know, you park and pull up there for 72 hours and move it to North he, College. He was going, yeah. And then come east, back to East, east North College. Yeah. yeah. You know, and it gets frustrating. I mean, it's, you know, it's a guy out there that's running a generator, you know, all night. And he puts his trash outside and picks it up when he leaves. You know, so it sits out there for a couple of days and things like that. But you know, I mean, wasn't that big of a deal to me? But it's definitely, it's, you know, I mean, it's a nuisance. It's just who is this guy? Well, I've just had people that have called that have been upset that you know, basically we, we have another resident in the community, but they're not having to pay property taxes and they're not having to pay, you know, utilities and the, you know that they're not really they're getting the benefits of being here, but they're not. I mean, I've had that argument. I've heard quite, I've heard very different ones, but. Well, uh, and, and depending on where they're parked, it can also become a safety issue. If they're parked on a street that then it doesn't have adequate access for yeah. emergency vehicles because the street is too narrow. I mean, that particular person wasn't, that wasn't the case, but we do have other Plus places. problems. Right. Um, and if you notice in the definition of a recreational vehicle, that also includes um, boats and mm -hmm. camper trailers and those kinds of things. And I know that that's been an issue um, at the staff level have an issue because there are people have large double wide trailers on the back of their big trucks that are parked in front of their house or they have a boat in front of their house and it's just become um, real in, in some of the residential areas it can be difficult for them to do snow removal I mean they just can't even do it um, and it's my thinking is that you know those those items should probably be stored I mean the public right-of-way isn't really supposed to be your storage facility I mean it's a place where you park and then you leave the next day but these a lot of these things these recreational type vehicles are just sitting there well, it, 
do we have any kind of property that if we had that property, it could be people could park there and we could maybe charge a parking fee for boats, RVs, big construction equipment, whatever? I mean, if we had such a property and we charge, that seems like that would be an answer to that. I don't know that we do. No, I don't think we do, but there are places around that you can. Um, well, you go down to Knickerbockers yeah. and go to your, yeah. I mean, they're all over the place. Yeah, there are places that, around the area where you could store it. Well, any storage facility basically has a place right. where you can Yeah, the issue becomes, you know, storage for the purpose of living in it temporarily. You know, I mean, that's the issue. That's, that's a different thing yeah. if you're living in it temporarily. Yeah. Or living in it. I mean, if you're, as we've, as we've talked before, if you're, if, you know, when you're getting ready to go on a big trip, you need to have your recreational vehicle there. You know, you need to be able to pack it. Load it up. Load it up and unload it and clean it. And, or right. if you've got an in-law coming, you want that. <laughs> right. Stay in the trailer truck. <laughs> <That's safe. laughs> yeah. And that does, that does happen or, or periodically. Or, does. Yeah, so. does. or they come in their RV. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, the thing about those situations is no, nobody knows about it. If you're storing your RV in your backyard or on a side yard, you know, and it's not used except when you go on your three month vacation. You know, but during the winter it's just stored up and somebody comes and they stay in it. Nobody notices. It's not a nuisance. You know, the nuisance comes when that person that's living in it starts to play a boom box in the middle of the night. And <laughs> so there's gotta be some legs on being able to take care of it if it becomes a nuisance. And I think the issue is we have these issues that are coming up because they are in fact a nuisance, but we don't have anything that we can pull any teeth that we have that gets us to relieve the nuisance. That's what I see it as. I'm not, you know, so I, I personally think that the way that the RV thing is written is just fine, you know, but the issue over storing or having overnight sleeping on a public right of way in a vehicle should have a time limit of whatever, 24 hours or whatever. And, it's and that's a, to me, that could be a nuisance code ordinance that goes to council and so be it. So. it, it and I don't disagree with you, Ted, but I think that perhaps you want to be mindful of whatever time limit you set because we do periodically have folks who that is the only shelter they have. So they yeah. need a few days to try to find alternate shelters. Oh, I was just, I'm 24 hours. Right, I'm just, a, I'm just yeah, saying whatever limit you, this commission decides well, to Well, and I don't know, I mean, if it, is it something that we would write or is it something that we just suggest to the police department to consider and if they want us to, to write it, we can take a stab at it. I just, I mean, I've talked to one of the sergeants and uh, police chief, and they were, you know, in agreement that there should be something and maybe just a time limit. I mean, if there, uh, you know, if there's a time limit, then they're going to be moving around. Yeah. And we can't, we just can't stop them from doing that. Right. You know, so um, is it possible for, let's see, right now in their code, there's nothing. In the police, right? There isn't anything. It's, it's just in the in in the zoning code. All they have in their code is construction equipment and trucks of a certain size, semi trailers and things like that. They don't have anything in there. So right now, it's a zoning violation it's that is served as a zoning summons as opposed to a general offenses violation. Correct. It and should be a general offenses violation, yeah. not a zoning. Sounds like something that we don't right. do. It really doesn't sound like something we do. Because if you read the, where it's at in the zoning code, it's unlawful to park it on a street if you're using it as a dwelling. So in other yeah. words, if, if you're not using it as a dwelling, you can park it. Yeah. And that's only found in the zoning code. And there's nothing in the in the general fences code. So or the so we can we can so you're suggesting we leave this as it is, 
but suggests that it, something is added. And it could even be added to what they already have here under 452.20. What page are you on? Um, this is just a, it's under the general fences code. It's at the end of it. Yeah. It's um, that they can't park any truck exceeding 10,000 pounds, gross vehicle weight, 20 feet in length. Do we want to hear from citizens? Yes. I'm going to open the public hearing. Would you like to come up and introduce yourself, please? No, I. Becky Campbell. Um, can't, don't we have fines for people who park illegally? Isn't there a fine that they have to pay if they're declared by the police department illegal parking? Why can't we make RV parking in the village illegal parking? But in a, or you can add a thing if after 24 hours or 48 hours if they're not moved, then they are fined for illegal parking. And I don't think we need to provide a place for RVs to park because there's many places surrounding our area here that stores them. Uh, especially like uh, at gyms over there as you're going to Kroger's. Uh, they have parking. There's many parking areas around here for RVs, and I don't think that's a village responsibility to find. Thank you. Thank you. So based on 4452, sorry, um, close the public hearing. Um, What's, do you have an answer? Um, I know I don't because I, I don't know where the, I'm, I didn't look at the, the parking section of the. Is 452.20, that's not a finable offense? It is, but there's, but she's talking about like, <clears throat> we have zones and then in another section of the code and I don't have that with me where it's like, you can park on these streets, but only so for four hours, on these streets for two hours, and I think that's what she's suggesting. Is. I think what we're saying is that we want to punt this to the ordinance, the, you know, the nuisance ordinance side of the ledger, and we don't consider it to be a zoning issue. That's the yeah. That's a different part of regulation. We don't do anything with parking fines or right. anything like that. Can't. Um, Sorry? You can't do a recommendation? No, I mean, we're saying we're going we're gonna to recommend to them to put that in, in that section yeah. of the code because right now it's only in zoning and it's, <clears throat> it's very difficult to enforce, right. sure you know, because you, get, you have to send a letter and they get five days notification and then it has to go through another set amount of time and, and it goes... It'd be faster, yeah. So is there um, a public process for getting that kind of thing, village? Oh, I mean, if, if, if this, yeah, I mean, it, it has to, that would be an ordinance, and it'd have a first and second reading at council. Yeah, that's yeah. something council does. Okay. I'll do that. Okay, so okay. you'll just do that? You mm -hmm. don't need to write anything up for uh, us uh, to... I mean, if, if they, probably it would expedite things if the Planning Commission made a recommendation to council, yeah. yes. Does anyone have a recommendation they want to make? Specifically? Or does anyone on the commission have a different opinion? <laughs> well, 
I didn't hear you. Yeah, I wouldn't know necessarily what to recommend. I think I suspect well, you know, passing I mean, an ordinance would have to be. If, if everyone's in agreement, then the recommend the motion would be to make a recommendation to council oh, that okay. they include RV parking on the street in the general offenses code. And then the details can be worked out by the solicitor. Yeah. Right. Yeah. By who? The solicitor. Chris Connor. Yeah. So a as far as the wording. So a recommendation to council to add RV parking restrictions in the general effect offenses section of the code. Does that sound okay? Yep. All right. All right. That's it. So well, you need a, a motion yeah. or second. And a, I guess I just have. Um, I guess Patty maybe brought this up. Probably most of the instances, if someone has an RV, it's sitting there or something, and sometimes people are living in it and they could have other options. But there are going to be some people who maybe, at least for some period of time, that's their only option. They're either in the RV or they're homeless. Yeah. <clears throat> so finding someone who can't afford any place else to live is not an effective way of dealing with that situation. Marianne, the only thing I'm going to say is that the police department is very proactive in finding other solutions for those folks. Yeah. Okay. And so, yeah. I, I think it yeah, would be a rare. Do you have that. an outreach coordinator who uh, might be? Yes, I think that would be a rare instance indeed if that were the situation and that person yeah. got fined. Okay. Thanks. I wonder how much it is to park your RV at Bryant. It's like fifteen dollars a night or something yeah, like that. Because we actually checked into that for a person that was yeah moving back and forth. Yeah, I mean, as long as they're moving back and forth, we really can't find them, correct? Like, there would be no there would be no way to word it really without like banning their RV from town after so many offenses to be able to do that. And well, I'm not a, Well, I mean, somebody, was, if they get a parking ticket, they're not going to want to keep getting parking tickets. Yeah, but what I'm saying is, like, if they keep getting, they can avoid getting parking tickets by moving within a certain amount of time. But, but I think that the ordinance could be written yeah. in such a way as to say, if the same RV consistently parks on a village street, for more than X number of days, be it yeah. in one place or multiple locations, that is considered a violation. I, okay. I'm pretty sure that that could be ordered in, and Denise can make sure that she talks to the solicitor about yeah. that. Yeah, okay. So, so then you still need your motion yeah, second. She, yeah, yes, yeah. thank you. With, with that stipulation, I would move to approve that recommendation. I'll second. You gonna call a vote or oh I'm yeah voting? sorry um, <laughs> Ted yes Marianne yes AJ yes Ted. Yep. yep me um, Rose yes okay. Does anyone else have anything to say about that piece of our agenda? I'm just glad we actually got through all of it. I'm really happy. Um, can we check in about the comprehensive land use plan? It's finally summer. It's finally summer. Start working. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I just you know finishing up the school year. Yeah. Um, Karen Wintrow said that um, uh, she has a good log of pictures at the chamber that we can pull from that she could share with me um, to use in the comprehensive land use plan because my other avenues, people thought they were giving me pictures that I, that fit the criteria that we're looking for, but they did not. <laughs> that's silly. Um, so uh, that's a really great resource that we have 
I, I, I did find more historical evidence about it being the um, first pool that yes. was um, integrated racially. And um, actually, though, it was really the only municipal pool in the area because the, the swimming pools in um, for Greene County weren't didn't open until much later. So mm -hmm. I have that information as well. So do we want to set a meeting date or a when we get together again, or do you want to let us know when you guys have had a chance now to? Do I did your my part? homework. I gave it to Frank. Yeah. Yeah, we, we need to get together and talk about it. So. <laughs> <laughs> you want to do that this week sometime? Um, yeah, we could do that. Let's start an email then. Okay. And then just let me know when okay. you want to maybe set up a time and we can just need a couple weeks, two, three weeks notice so I can put it in the paper and that will good. All right. Okay. Um, I think that's it, unless anyone has anything else. Do we want to? What um, about agenda planning? Agenda planning, yes. So other than the comprehensive land use plan, what else do we have on our upcoming? Um, I'm going to bring this back on the RVs. Um, uh, not the RVs, I'm sorry. The uh, uh, lot French. Lot, my minimum lot French, thank you. <laughs> And I just a little bit about the tiny homes. I just want to add a little something in there um, for that. And I'll probably do that as um, a text amendment for a public hearing. Because um, unless you feel it needs to be discussed one more time, if not, I'll just do it that way and then we can always um, amend it during our discussion. Okay. And do we have any um, public hearings coming up? Um, uh, there are some things in the works. Um, the um, uh, home Inc. has uh, was probably going to be bringing, but it might be. It's going to be a little bit longer. Uh, they're going to actually do a PUD, so that's going to be a lengthy process at some point. Um, they've um, secured the property behind where the new fire station is. So they're going to be doing a um, apartment um, actually do you do you know is it it's a, is it senior or is it yeah, yeah the, the uh, it's apartment complex I assume I, I haven't talked to oh, yeah, Emily okay. but that's what I, I believe yeah I believe it's like it was in the paper today was it, oh is it senior senior, senior house. okay right okay. so So that'll be something big coming up, and then there's just some other things that you know, okay. we'll see. Okay, our next meeting is July 9th. 9th? Yeah. Okay. And I'm sorry, I'm coming very uh, Frank, did, is that the one you said you would yeah, not be not at? Be Okay, so. uh, motion to adjourn. I move. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 So AJ, if you're available on that day. Okay. Yeah, all right. Okay. <laughs> For July 9th, we'll let you know. Yellow Springs, summer shoes. Yeah.